to tell you the story of the, of the Red Sea, of the Gulf of Aqaba, where we are, uh, perhaps would be the right thing to do in this community so that you would appreciate um, the difference between the Great Barrier Reef here, not only in size and, and the Gulf of Aqaba, but in the functioning, the way the, the, this Gulf is functioning, which in my opinion is, has no parallel in the world, and that's what I would like to convey uh, today. So, um, the focus of the talk will be on, it, it will consist of two chapters. One is why we don't get bleaching in Eilat, and this photograph is of course from here, from the GPR, and why sometimes we get the reef covered with algae, with a thick layer of algae that smothers coral, so we have mortality due to the algae, but we don't have mortality due to bleaching, and it all is related to one parameter that I would try to convince you that that's the case. So, uh, before I start, I have to acknowledge Moz Fine, that I'm sure many of you know. Uh, he's a co-author on the lack of uh, bleaching, the, the lead author on, on that paper, and has a Gildor, a physical oceanographer. And in the second chapter, uh, I have to acknowledge that I would like to acknowledge the monitoring. We have a national monitoring program at our institute that uh, monitors both the coral reef and the open oceans, and much of our understanding comes from this monitoring. That, by the way, it's an uh, open public domain, so anybody who wants to know what's going on there, we, uh, I can guide you on how to access the data. Uh, and a little bit background on where we are, although there is some light here that uh, doesn't provide the details, but here, that's our institute. That's the IOI, the Inter-University Institute that belongs to all the institute, or universities in Israel. That's the way it looks like from, uh, from the air, and we are right on the water, and the coral reef that you can see here comes all the way here, and it's very accessible. We don't have waves, uh, uh, we don't have sharks, so <laughs> <laughs> you can work 24 hours a day and, 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 and go into the water and we can use the pier here uh, and also places here to extend cables and, and monitor in real time many, many parameters and also using the power source at the lab and on the pier to manipulate things. So you can grow corals under whatever kind of regime you want by putting some pumps that will pump water and increase the speed or nutrients or whatever you want, and uh, we take a uh, major advantage of that. Some of this will be reflected here. Where we are, so um, here's the Indian Ocean. So in order to get to Elat, you have to go through the uh, Gulf of Eden here, and then 2,000 kilometers Red Sea, and then here's the Gulf of Aqaba. 180 kilometers, and we are right here at the tip. And since that area is um, tectonically active, so that plate is getting away from the plate here of Africa, so this is an ocean in the opening, and therefore uh, we have a very steep slope. It's, kept, it's active, and it's actively being opened. So in a boat ride of about, what, I don't know, five minutes, you get to bottom depth of 750 kilo, uh, meters. So that's pretty deep uh, water body. And if you go beyond the border, so the border with Egypt is right here. If you go further to the south, you get to 900 meters. And the deepest place in the, in the Gulf is over uh, about two kilometers in depth. And if we go to the Red Sea further down, then you get to almost two and a half kilometers in depth. And I'd like to provide some background to the oceanography of this water body. We have about half a centimeter evaporation every day. It's very dry. We don't have any input of fresh water. Even you know, the big river that drains all that area in Africa, the Nile, it goes to the Mediterranean. It doesn't go to the Red Sea. So there is not much of input here. Evaporation of half a centimeter a day over 2,000 kilometers you need to get water back into the Gulf, into the Red Sea, and all the water comes from here, from the Straits, except that the Strait 
is, uh, it's called Babel Mandel. The, the place is very shallow, 137 meters in depth. Now that has lots of implications as we will see uh, later on. The circulation above the seal here is that, that we get flow in in the upper layer, so the upper 80 meters or so, and outflow of denser water that makes the you know, creates the bottom water here in, in, the, in the Gulf of Aden that goes above the seal. Sometimes in some season you have also influx of water at depth, but most of the water comes at the shallow, uh, as a shallow uh, uh, layer of about 80 meters, as I said, and, uh, uh, and that compensates for the salinity or the, the loss of fresh water. So overall, this is the highest salinity in any ocean that is connected to the open ocean or any sea that is connected. We get salinity by the time the water gets to Elat, we have about 41 uh, per mil salinity, which is really high. Um, then we, we get, you know, alerts, extreme alerts. Uh, it's hard to see the colors there, but uh, we are really in the, in the dark blue, uh, red area of the bleaching alert and yet we don't get bleaching. There has never been bleaching in the Gulf of Aqaba. There is bleaching in the, in the Red Sea, but not in the Gulf of Aqaba. To the best we know, you know, records didn't start too long ago, uh, but we don't get bleaching, and yet the water is warming. So this is from the monitoring program. For 30 years, we are measuring the, the temperature, the sea surface temperature, and the rate of warming is more or less the average, you know, three point something degrees per hundred years, uh, and the water now is warmer than when we started, of course. And if you calculate the, uh, the bleaching, the temperature, the heating weeks, and uh, to what extent we should have seen bleaching in the Gulf, then there were several years uh, that bleaching should have occurred if, we, if the corals follow the 1.5 rule. Of, of warming and then following uh, the loss of the Santiri, yet the corals don't bleach in Eilat. And we ask ourselves, how come? But before that, we did some experiments. We, uh, this is Maoz's part, so Maoz um, warmed up the corals. He has a, a simulator, similar in essence, but not in magnitude, and and, you know, and, and, and beauty as we saw, as I saw yesterday at Ames, but it's functional and it, it works very well. And he took corals, several species, uh, from the coral reef in Eilat, so Stylophora, Pocilopora and others, and he incubated them in his simulator, he gradually, gradually warmed up the water and he got, you know, four, seven degrees above the local maximum. And bleaching signs, none. It, it, you know, the group of uh, Christine Ferrier from Monaco, they, they come and they, uh, they, they study warming effect on, and, and bleaching in the corals. They come and they collect the stylophora and other corals in Aqaba and also in Eilat. And they, warm up, they boil the corals and you know, the corals eventually die by perhaps denaturalization of, uh, de uh, of proteins. The proteins get, get knocked down, but Zeus and Tiri, no, they, don't, they never bleach. So what's going on here? Um, if we go back 20,000 years, and that, that graph is taken from a paper by Sidol, then during the peak of the glacial period, so 20,000 years ago, sea level was about 120 meters below present all over the, the oceans and including the Red Sea, these papers coming from the Red Sea and they reconst reconstructed the, uh, the sea level and if you look at the sea level at present in black and in blue the peak of the glacial then all is left here if you take 120 meters below all is left here is 17 meters of water evaporation, you know, cold air and if the water was warm, of course less warm than today, but cold air is a very effective means of getting evaporation high, and I'll get to that later. So, if you have only 17 meters here, 
at 70 meters of passage. You, you cannot have this steady state balance between the in, influx of relatively fresher water and the outflux of saltier water to keep the balance and salinity would definitely go up and here from the same paper by Sidal they they modeled they modeled the, the salinity there you, you cannot find any any fauna to you know to, to analyze the in foraminifera you know the stable isotopes because as they call it here the gray areas they call it a planktonic period. Why? Because based on simulations that are based on the period that there were some animals there, or that there are fossils from that period, they modeled the salinity and they predicted something like on the order of maybe 765 per mil of standard units of salinity. The only organisms left there were bacteria, you know, halophilic bacteria. No coral reef, no fish, no foraminifera. All the metazoans are just gone. There is no fossil record from the glacial periods, and that's not the only one, but there was another one. So we have a reset of the coral reef of Eilat, not of the Red Sea, including the Gulf of Aqaba. So eradication of a coral reef inside the Red Sea, but outside we still have coral reefs. So if we go back in time to 8,000 years ago, sea level again was high, closer to the present. Uh, conditions were already ripe for corals to start going into the Gulf again. And recolonization of corals into the Red Sea could have originated only in the Indian Ocean. Now, let's simulate, and that's what we did with Hezi Gildo, the physical oceanographer, let's simulate the influx of larvae, of coral tunnelae, into the Red Sea from this area here. And, you know, if you get tunnelae, most of the corals would have short-lived tunnelae, right? So they would be in the water on the order of days. Let's take those species that perhaps have the larvae out there in the plankton, in the planktonic stage, and still capable of recruiting for one month. So, how far into the Red Sea they would get into one month, and Hezi modeled that, and still the larvae would stay within, this is the results of the model, they would stay into, in this warm area here, which has about 32 degrees in the summer. Now, in order to, so the, the way the corals would get, eventually they would get to a lot, and the line here is more or less, you know, south to north or higher latitude here, is that they would get here and then another stepping stone, another stepping stone. So the stepping, the maximum stepping stone here would be still would retain them in the warm area. And then the corals would settle. And how long would it take them to produce the next stepping stone, the larvae for the next stepping stone? At least one year. Because the coral has to grow, start reproducing, so something the fact is that they have to spend the summer in this area. So they have to sustain 32 degrees, maybe 34. So this is a very effective, selective uh, barrier, perhaps similar to what Van Open is doing there and uh, you know, in the simulator and root gates in, in, in Hawaii. She used to do that. Because you select only those individuals or colonies that can survive high temperature. Those corals that cannot sustain in the hollow beyond, the hollow beyond of the coral and the zoo sandilia, sandili, those that cannot sustain 34 degrees, 32, 34 degrees, would not go, would not enter the Red Sea, would not survive in the Red Sea. And eventually, they made their all their way, all the way here to Eilat, and Eilat is uh, 29 and a half degrees north, maximum temperature in Eilat, is uh, 27, 28 degrees. These corals are adapted to 32. And therefore, if we take the maximum 28, we warm up the water to 29 and a half for the one and a half degrees rule, they would not bleach because they, they went through this selectivity of uh, very warm water. So we think that, we, we claim that that's the explanation 
for the lack of bleaching. Without bleaching, the reef in Eilat is doing pretty well. Unlike some really disturbing uh, trends that we, that we find from papers coming from here, from the GPR, in, in Eilat, the coral cover uh, s gradually increasing, very gradually, very slowly. But we, we got rid also of the fish cages that used to be in the long past uh, in Eilat, so there are no major sources of eutrophication. Now also pollution is, is pretty well controlled. So we have an increase both in coral density and in coral coverage. So the reef, overall the reef is stable and is doing well. Diversity is stable from the days of Yossi Goya, like 50 years ago, uh, has not changed much. Uh, so if we summarize what this chapter of the talk, so uh, we find a refuge from bleaching in the Gulf of Aqaba. I must emphasize again, it's only the Gulf of Aqaba. It's not the Red Sea. The Red Sea is warm enough so they get a warming that bleach, does bleach, bleach the, the, the cores there, so they get bleaching event, but only from the central part or uh, not in the very northern part of the Red Sea, which is already sufficiently cold or it doesn't get that warm in, in, in the northern parts. But Gulf of Aqaba is really uh, an exception, I think, as far as the size of the site that doesn't get bleach. Uh, we claim we want to, we ask people, let's work and, you know, declare that a world heritage site, but that, you know, politics in the Middle East is so complex. So we have Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Egypt, and it didn't go anywhere. So, so far it's not world heritage site. But I think that it needs to have more emphasized by, uh, by the community here because think about what we can learn from there and, and this is just a tip I think. So it needs to be used, for example, uh, we have 8,000, the, 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 the age of the corals, that, or of the, coral, the modern coral reef in Eilat is 8,000 years. These corals are adapted to, uh, you know, to, to the temperature of 32, 34, but here they live for 8,000 years in, in waters that are much colder. Now, in evolutionary terms, did they lose the adaptation to bleaching? No, they didn't. So, if we think about how long, if you, you know, what is the dynamics of, in evolutionary time of this adaptation and what is the selective force to lose the genes that would allow that adaptation? So, here you can use that in order to study things like that. And, and I think it's, it's studying now much due to Moe's fine and he finds some collaboration in the South and, and so they look at that. But, you know, we are not in the 50, the initiative for the 50 reefs. The Red Sea is not part of it, or at least not the Gulf is not part of it and advocate that. So, based on our calculation, and we dare publishing that, that bleaching would start on the rate, the current rate of bleaching uh, of warming, so the, uh, in Eilat, in, it will take another 100 years before we start seeing bleaching in the Gulf of Aqaba. And we dare publishing that, and then here, there, I, I, I bought really a uh, small, small hat, I immersed it in, in good sauce, and uh, because if bleaching occurs in Eilat, I'll have to eat my hat. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, but we did uh, put in the prediction that bleaching would not occur there. Maoz is dubious. He said, well, we, if only if we keep the synergetic effect to the minimum here, uh, like if there would be more pollution and more disturbance by tourism and the corals would feel, uh, yeah, maybe synergetic effect would have that. But, that's what we think going on now, and let's move to the second chapter. What does kill corals in Eilat? And this is the massive algal plume. And the roots are the same as I would lead you to right now. So that's the, the same plot that we had before of the inflow of uh, water at the surface, near the surface, upper 80 meters, and outflow down below. So what does it mean that we get water definitely shallower than 130 meters, that's the depth of the seal here, but 
perhaps even shallower, if you look at a temperature profile in any ocean, you know, you have stratification, so this is taken from a Y, the surface is, temperature is 27, and then if you go down to 137 meters here, then you get, what, about 18, no, 138 would be something 21 degrees centigrade, but the deeper water, which is heavier and colder, would not go because of the seal depth. It's too shallow for water, for cold, heavier water to come over the seal and enter the Red Sea. So therefore, in the Red Sea, there is no source of cold water. The coldest place in the Red Sea is Eilat. A so Eilat in the winter, you'll see the temperature. I mean, we still wear shorts in Eilat in the, in the winter time. Well, maybe sometimes we put long pants, but, uh, but there is no really cold, a source of cold water in, a, in, in the Red Sea, and therefore, if you lower a CTD here, and now it's well known, if you lower a CTD here to two, two and a half kilometers deep here in the center of the Red Sea, the temperature here at two and a half kilometers deep, which usually I didn't get here, but it's usually around what three, two, three degrees in the Red Sea, 21 degrees. Really warm water in the Red Sea. That, that has implications to zooplankton and the fluxes because you have bacteria that work under 20 degrees through the water column, so much less organic material get to the bottom. And that's an opening for a whole world to compare the deep sea biology in the Red Sea to other places in the world, and it has been done and being done right now, but that's the difference. So we don't get warm, uh, cold water and therefore stratification. The difference in the water buoyancy between the surface and the deep layers is very, very weak. We don't get strong stratification ever and ever in, uh, in the Red Sea, but more so in a lot. So if you compare the temperature, say the previous graph in Hawaii, which has similar sea surface temperature to what we find in a lot. So in a lot, it goes down to 21 degrees uh, at 700, that's in our monitoring station uh, of the lab in a lot. Uh, here in Hawaii, you get 16 degrees uh, difference between the surface and, and, and the deep water, whereas here you get only 6 degrees difference between here and there. So comes the winter, and still we get lower temperature during the winter, and I'll, I'll show you that graph. It's enough, it's in, uh, the, the cooling in the winter is enough to push the surface, to cool down this surface temperature to that temperature, so if you create convective mixing by the cooling here, every year we get convective mixing that reaches this depth, the, uh, depth, and if it's colder, it may reach even this depth. And if it reaches this depth, it's enough that you extend the winter by maybe two weeks, or you lower the air temperature by tenth of a degree, then to mix, to deepen the mixing from here to here doesn't take much because you only have to cool by a few hundreds of a degrees the water in order to get the mixing if the mixing reaches here to cool it down and then you extend the mixing depth by 200 meters depending on the length of the winter how cold it got during that winter so in, in cold winters we get deep mixing now it, it never happens and I will skip that slide it never happens in Hawaii because in Hawaii you know they have Antarctica and Greenland, in, in the general ocean you have these sources of really cold winter, uh, winter and therefore you get that strong stratification. And here is the temperature in a lot. So in the winter time, the air temperature and the, uh, and the sea temperature, so air temperature during the winter, so starting in November uh, and going all the way to um, the end of March, so April, depending on, on the year there is uh, interannual variability, but you get air temperature colder than sea, t than the water temperature. Now that's the best means, the best tool to cool down the, the water for, uh, you know, the biologists among us that not all of us are really aware of that, evap the evaporation is the main uh, process to cool down the, the surface and I have well, we cannot see it here with this light, but it's amazing to see that, like during the winter time, when you have days that the water, that the air temperature is about here, it was um, 15.5 degrees difference. Though the air was below 10 degrees, like 8 degrees, and the water was 
uh, around 20 degrees, uh, 21 degrees, and, and then you could actually see the water, oops, the water pumping, being pumped into the air. Where is it? Um, like, it's hard to see here because, uh, you know, the, you, you, the, the water comes very dry from the, from the desert around us, and, and the air, sorry, the air comes very dry with the northerly wind, the wind always goes along the Gulf, and then it warms up as it evaporates the water, and then it shoots up to the atmosphere because it warms up, and dry air come that doesn't have any water vapor in it comes down, and then you have this evaporation pump working very, very effectively. So the colder the winter, the more evaporation you get, and the colder the water, uh, and then the deeper the mixing, the convective mixing during uh, the winter. So here is just example from quite warm year, so 2005, you have the stratified water column in the summertime, then you have November, the, mi the mixing got to 200 during this year, January it got there, in March, well, maybe down to 400 meters, but look, in March you already cut the mixing. In March the sun warms up the surface layer, no more mixing, although you can call the, the deeper layer mixed layer, but what is unique about that, that the mixing is really mixed, I, I'll show you in a moment, uh, and this is the mixing depth evaluated visually as, as they did before, and, uh, and in warm years, what, we get 200 and 300 meters, maybe in really warm winter we, we get less than 200 meters, but in cold years you get oh, about 700 meters, like, there is no, no ocean that I know of in the world that gets mixing down to 800 meters, 700 meters uh, in, in cold. Th this, it, it simply never happens. Uh, we have Mediterranean, you know, with a uh, shallow strait of Gibraltar, and they get, in very, very cold winters, they get mixing down to 300, 400 meters, maybe, four, uh, but never to 800 meters. So this is a unique feature of, uh, of the Gulf, and the mixed layer is on, it's not, not, not only you know, homogeneous temperature that goes down. So this is the summer, and that's the, the, the winter, and here you can see the mixed layer at 21.1. But I want to point out the, the phytoplankton. So here is the chlorophyll fluorescence, and, and you get phytoplankton down to 600, 700, depending on the mixing layer. It, it gets down to the precisely the depth of the mix layer depth. And these phytoplankton, the mixing is so intense, maybe you should, you know, we, we don't have a physical oceanography that has modeled the residence time of the water. Like, how long, what is the expectancy of a cell, of a phytoplankton cell that now is found at 500 meters under complete darkness? Recall that the photic layer is about 100 meters. 120 meters. So those cells that are found here are in darkness. What, what is the expectancy of time? How long it, will it take them to come back to the light? You know, to the shallow uh, layers. We think it's on the order of, of a day or less than a day because you don't see any gradient in chlorophyll. You don't see any gradient in oxygen. And oxygen, regardless of mixing, is produced by by uh, phytoplankton only in the in the deep in in the deep water. Uh, uh, sorry, in the layer. Uh, so oxygen is produced only in the upper layer by photosynthesis and exchange with the atmosphere. And yet the line looks straight. So the mixing must be very very in intensive. Uh, I would just mention on the side that you take this water, you take water from 600 meters here during the mixing. And you take water from 20 meters, and you bring the water to the lab, and you illuminate both bottles, and the photosynthesis rate would be the same. Like the, f the, the phytoplankton that is found down here is fully viable. It's respiring, it's, it, it's viable, it has a lot to do with, those of you who know the critical depth hypothesis of Sverdu, so we, we work on that as well there, I, 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 it doesn't work. I mean, there is no critical depth here. <laughs> uh, but uh, we published it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but uh, it, it's a, a great place to, to study the adaptation of phytoplankton. But that's a site. Uh, we are still with the uh, corals. 
what I want to mention is that if you get deep mixing, the, chlor the nutrient profile in the Gulf looks pretty normal, like you would find in any other ocean. In other words, nutrients are increasing with that. So if you get lots of, I mean, very deep mixing, then you, you get lots of nutrients in the surface layer. And that's the explanation for, for the plume, of course. Uh, and because we have deep mixing every day, every year, every winter, the sea in Ela, this is the chlorophyll dynamics, you know, this is the bloom, 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 bloom. And I put here in red the, the chlorophyll in Bermuda compared to another oligotrophic ocean. And you can see that the Gulf of Eilat or Gulf of Aqaba is not really extremely oligotrophic because, because of that mixing. So we get, and, and that affects the, the chlorophyll or the phytoplankton throughout the Gulf. So this is a, a slide from the spring times and you can see that the, the, the bloom extends from the tip of the Gulf where Eilat is to here, a place called Sharm el-Sheikh. And in the summer, everything is more ligotrophic. And also, it set the stage for the bloom dynamics. So this is, uh, the vertical axis is the, the chlorophyll concentration during the bloom. And here's the mixing depth during the year, and the R square is 0.6. And you can plot the same, the R square goes down to about 0.45, but still highly significant, if you plot the, chlorof the mean chlorophyll for the entire year. So it set the stage for the year that follows the winter uh, and, the, and the, the mixing depth that occurred there. <coughs> then uh, sometimes, you know, when the mixing is really, really deep, uh, and we published that long ago, uh, the, the coral, you don't see corals in the reef. Everything in this case, during that year, it's uh, enteromorpha, now they call it ulva. So green alga that smothered the corals, uh, I think that I have, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll show you the slides later on. And we related to the Pinatubo eruption. So you, everybody, I think, here knows about the Pinatubo eruption that offset the global warming by maybe three years or so. Uh, and we didn't get any ash from the Pinatubo, of course. We, we are, what, it's about, from the Pinatubo to Ilat, it's about 9,000 kilometers. But suddenly the winter was colder much colder after the Pinatubo because the major effect of the Pinatubo and for that matter any major eruption on, on the size, on the scale of the Pinatubo of course there are not that many eruptions that are on that scale because that was a gigantic scale but there are some eruptions that are, that are really good in, on good scale and I'll get to that in, in a moment but it creates uh, eruption of that it's not the Iceland eruptions that we had you know very coarse you know, ash that came out. Here we had a quantity in the, in the Pinatubo, a 10 to the time of 13 grams of sulfuric acid, if you will, of, of uh, aerosol, sulfuric aerosol, and that's the aerosol, and that's taken from a paper by Hoopert now, uh, and, 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 and you can see the aerosol of the Pinatubo uh, a few weeks after the eruption, and that's the normal state of the world as far as that aerosol is concerned. And that, according to that paper by Halpert, uh, and this is based on tree rings and other work on, on, on stable isotopes. Whenever we have a major eruption in the tropics, and we have that, you know, that area of the tropic being masked, so the, you know, the differential heating in of, the, of the tropics compared to high latitude, which drives the Hadley cells and you know the wind regime over the globe um, is disrupted by the fact that you get less radiation in the tropics. So what happens is that some places on Earth become colder, and some places like North America, the anomaly is warmer after such eruptions. The same in Eurasia, but in the Middle East, in the Middle East, it becomes colder by about three degrees, and the same in Greenland. Now, if you get three degrees colder air during the winter time, and indeed I managed to put my hands on some record that pilots used to record the air temperature whenever, before they take off. So we, I get records that go back to the 50s, and indeed we see at least two major eruptions, maybe a third, but look here, this is Basimini, which was a major eruption, but 
There was also a cold winter before the eruption. So we have cold winters regardless of volcanism. But whenever you have a, a major volcanic eruption like the El Quijon in Mexico and the Pinatubo, then the winter temperature is much lower than in other years. Now you get colder temperature, the profile during the winter after the Pinatubo and the plot that Halper plotted there was the winter temperature, the anomaly during the winter following uh, the eruption. The eruption occurred in June 91 and that was, uh, the cold winter was in 92. And this is the profile of the CTD. That's, that's the one you saw before with the certification. So we lowered the CTD, we extended a little bit into Egyptian waters and we lowered the CTD there, and the CTD came back with sediment because you know, that was the bottom depth there. So the mixing, based on models, we think that the mixing reached about 1,000 meters during that time. So you have mixing to 1,000 meters. Imagine the quantity of, you know, of nutrients that are being entrained and, and, uh, to, to the surface later, and that's what we see. So both, you know, here, I, that, these are the algae. And these are the phytoplankton. So both the phytoplankton, that's the bloom, the, sp the, the spring bloom during the 92 spring, and 3.5 milligram per cubic meter. That, that's similar to the green water that you find off, uh, you know, California, or Southern California. And we we never find these values in in, in the Gulf of Aqaba. It's uh, it's still pretty blue waters and transparent water. But during that year, that was, you know, we had a submersible, a touristic submersible in the nearby observatory. And they used, they used to take tourists to see the deep reef, the mesophotic reef. They went out of business for three, three months because you couldn't see, you know, beyond five meters away because the water was so murky. Anyway, question is, you know, when, when that bloom that here, you can see a little bit with the light, uh, but uh, you, you can see the, more or less the, the depth of that algal mat. So the algal mat made few changes to the corals. First of all, it must the light. The corals were, you know, exposed for very little light that could penetrate through this thick, you know, mat of, of alga. Secondly, current stopped. I mean, the, cor the, the corals were not exposed to the currents because of the algae. And thirdly, these algae, you know, they, they mustered light for themselves in a way. So the, the bottom layer got, became anaerobic because there was not much ventilation. So of course, with the mass, uh, and we were, frankly, we were not geared up to that. I, um, I talked with Mike and <laughs> Terry, I mean, the, our lab is out there in the sea. Not, not in, uh, we cannot control it. So here comes the bloom, and we need to do something about it in order to understand it. So we were not geared up to, to measure everything there. So for example, sulfide, we didn't measure. But it's definitely that when we took those algae, went up to the surface, took the mask off and smelled it, I mean, it was very obvious that it was anaerobic in, in the bottom. So that, all these three parameters are really damaging corals and, and, and yeah, here is, you know, those, we, unlike here, we have lots of sea urchins. Sea urchins are major grazers, including also, of course, the fish. So it's hard to see them here, but here in this crevice, under this small knoll of corals, there are five sea urchins, and all they needed at that time to eat is that. That was enough. Their functional response is so ineffective. So they didn't graze all the corals because that's the way. I mean, the, I think that the fish are, are effective and we have some indirect, and again, it's not a, a perfect study from, by the virtue that we couldn't get all the parameters done, but if you look at the, the mortality of the corals, so uh, in June, the, 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 al the alga started to recede, the water became warmer, Nutrients became uh, lower, but that alga likes the colder water, so it doesn't like very much the, the warmer water. And what was left behind were about 20% of white skeleton dead corals. So it lasted about three months, the corals, so I would say two months that they were covered with thick mud, and, um, and, and that killed about fifth of the corals along the Gulf. And uh, that's 
one interesting observation is that the 20% are all branching cores. The massive cores, and I have no explanation, the massive cores are doing much better as far as these three parameters, the light, of the, you know, the flow, and the anaerobic conditions. And that yet to be investigated as you know, resilience to, these, um, to that effect by the massive cores. But here we have, we call it nature reserve. That's the control part. And in the, in the nature reserve, we have a few sections where there are lots of herbivorous fish. Mostly acanthurids and cygonids. Uh, and, and they, especially the country, they sleep in, some, they have some places where all the group is, uh, I mean, the hundreds of fish are staying there. Lynn Montgomery used to work on them and, uh, and he documented every day the way they go out and, and, and to graze. And usually they pass over a few kilometers on a daily basis to graze for the algae. During that time, they didn't have to swim far. All the algae were there and they, cleared some patches. So there were some patches where we had algae, but they were not, they, the alga did not develop this map. And this is the control that in, in those patches that we measured the mortality, there was no mortality of corals. And then we say it's not the colder temperature. Well, it was colder by a few tenths of a degree, but it was not the temperature. It was not the phytoplankton bloom that made the water murky. It was the coverage by that green alga that actually smothered um, the algae. So then when we were just about to uh, publish that uh, paper, a book came out in, uh, now it's translated, I think also to Hebrew, by Yossi Doya and, and Rami Klein. Uh, and, and in that book, this is in Hebrew, in that book they have a, a picture, not as stunning as the one I have, but in Hebrew <laughs> it says, it says here that the coral reef was covered by al green alga, and that caused a substantial mortality, unmeasured, but substantial mortality of the corals in Eilat. And then, in small letters, uh, they also uh, say, in, in the winter of 1983, we call it, that's the winter after the El Tijon eruption. So what we claim is that that, and, and these are the temperatures there that indeed that winter was colder than normal, so we had some anomaly there. So that disturbance, if we call that disturbance, occurs, well, on intermediate scale? Is that, uh, you know, that when Connell published his paper in science on in the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, he referred to the diversity indices that Yossi Loya got from this reef. And he in his writing, in that paper, in science, he, he, he refers to, well, these are relatively small corals that indicate that some disturbance occurs here on a regular basis, and the diversity, the high diversity of the corals requires that uh, there would be some intermediate disturbance over there, except that we don't have that. We, we never have cyclones uh, in, in the Gulf. And, uh, and we think that this is the intermediate disturbance that clears, and indeed, you know, fifth of the space <coughs> is cleared, and uh, corals recruited after that. So it may be positive. So on the positive, we have no bleaching. This is really good. And the reef flourishes relatively. On the negative, I'm not sure it's totally negative because it's natural disturbance, but we have corals smothering by algal blooms. Uh, and as the say goes, by Jerome K. Jerome in Three Men in a Boat. So there is nothing good without nothing, with something bad into it. So that's his saying, it's not mine, but uh, uh, anyway. So this is the story uh, of, of the Red Sea and it's um, of the Gulf of Aqaba and, uh, and its uniqueness. So I'm open here for questions. <laughs>